Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I should say it's absolutely a first time for me to be in Latvia and also Riga. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, I taught in the past a couple of Latvian students from Riga, and uh, one of uh, my students, former students, right now is working at my office and she's doing a fantastic job. Uh, through her diploma, I, I advised, uh, we went through, um, you know, her diploma was dealing with a series of questions and then also the future development of regions in Latvia. So, um, actually, I was surprised, you know, what I have seen in the past two days that the um, association actually took me from Riga to three hours to the western part of Riga and then three hours to the eastern part of um, Latvia and um, it's just a really fantastic experience to understand physically um, the high quality of architecture. Um, I believe that architecture spaces um, is not only autonomous but has a relationship to its surrounding. The role of the architect is to design architectural space that is to design buildings and that relationship of those buildings to their surroundings. Creating an architecture space that is distinctive to its local context and community, instead of building a standard and uniform facility, is only possible, I believe, when it is planned together with infrastructure, you know, that is physical, organizational, and social. In this context of discussion, I've always been interested in new ideas that could change architects' professional relationship to the making of the city. Um, I always somewhat represent Switzerland, but I am Japanese, and then I am a Japanese architect. This is the aerial view of Tokyo. And uh, I hope that uh, my presentation today will have some interesting links to your topics. My office is actually located in Zurich, and we are based, a Zurich-based office for architecture, urban design, and research. I actually studied architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in the USA, graduating with a research diploma called um, Harvard Guide to Shopping. Uh, with Rim Cow House, that was in 1998. And afterwards, um, I decided to go back to Japan and worked for a Japanese architect, Toyo Ito, um, in Tokyo for about five years. At that time, Toyo Ito and in his office was building a project called Sendai Media Take in Sendai. Uh, the construction of the building has just started in 1997. This project seemed so exciting to me, and because no building type called media take existed um, yet in Japan at that time. Therefore, the architect, the city as a client, city planners, and the public as users participated in the process of making both the software and the hardware of the project. Surprisingly, at that time, this process was new. In Japan, let's say in 1960s and 70s, the Japanese architect called Arata Isozaki, his um, critics and theoreticians, he writes a lot about architecture, had a very strong influence to the next generation architects. Um, he had declared, after he got disappointed by seeing the implementation of metabolist idea in Japan, he declared withdrawal from the city. As an architect, I'm not going to deal with anything anymore with the city. So that was in the 70s, and then since then, younger generation of architects like Kenzo Tange, or uh, not, not Kenzo Tange, Kazuo Shinohara or Tadao Ando have focused on a search for purity in design within a private lot. So for a long, long, long time, the city was not 
discussed among Japanese architects, or at least architects in Japan. But in my office, for example, here in Europe, a practice naturally <laughs> works with all scales. For example, here we have a study for railroad station um, area in St. Moritz, uh, which is in Switzerland. This project is part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site and was chosen as the basis for the new zoning plan in 2009. So this was the site. And uh, this is the site plan, actually. This is the Congress Center and the hotel. Uh, this is the railroad station. This is the UNESCO heritage, all the buildings. And actually, the prize was given to the two companies. Uh, this building was won by a German architect, and we actually won this part. These are the combination of retail and an offices. Our idea was to give another platform, then connect this new village to the center of the San Moritz. This is the view from the new platform which we designed and then looking towards the station. This project is called MetroBuild. Um, MetroBuild is basically an image or a concept plan for the metropolitan region of Zurich. It's a study commission that we received and we did in 2011. The concept plan reveals that Zurich is actually a diverse mosaic of locations that is in its totality competes in a global market. Another project is called Engadin Airport. It's also in St. Moritz in Switzerland. And it's about 28,000 square meters of private airport. Um, this was an invited competition for which we won the first prize in 2008. So that was the airport site, and an idea was whole building is about 400 square meter long, and we call it Sun Gate, you know, where the yellow um, lit it, and then we have the terrace uh, viewing to the mountains. So this is showing the restaurant in connection to the terrace. This is the model that we presented to the client. And as I said, the idea was that, uh, you know, which is airport building and then it's still industrial building, there are a lot of, they call it hangars, the parking place for airplane, helicopters, and, and so on. So basically, this is a um, lobby, but we have hangar uh, next to the lobby, and uh, our proposal is the only one who had that. And when, because this airport belongs to the small villages, and then the airport itself became a community center for the village. So we thought when people gathered, actually, that we combined the lobby and the hangar, so therefore we can create 3,000 3, square meters of event space when it is necessary. And then the next project is called um, Partnership Smatinska. It was the first um, PPT, public and private ownership uh, project, was happened in Ljubljana. It's the capital of Slovenia. Overall site is 230 hectare. It's a mixed use master plan that, that we won our first prize in 2008 and we've been, since then we have been working on it. And of course, it had an effect of the um, economic crisis, so it is on and off and then sometimes it's on hold but we're still working on it. And then the basic idea for this master plan is came out of, you know, when my partner was teaching at the Berlage in the Netherlands, and uh, they did the project called Light Capital, Urban Scripts for Rivoliano. So this is the correction of the student's work. So this shows the 230 hectares of urban uh, master plan area in Rivoliano. And the Central Park, or the park located in center, is about seven hectares. This is the vision. And then we call it an amateur because it's very important that the new city or a new area is not disconnected from the old town of Ljubljana. So therefore, um, we concentrated and analyzed how people actually walk. And then this walking or the pedestrian networks um, in relation with the park was in the whole project very, very important. 
It's a very, very small uh, residential project that we're currently working on in France, near Geneva. The construction of this project will start on uh, actually this month. It's a 150 square meters residence. Our client is actually a 28 year old uh, person and who is actually college, has a college to build and uh, spend money to make on her own house. So this is a very simple site plan that south is this way. This is existing her parents' house and in the garage. She got inherited uh, this part of the land. So therefore, we created not just that mass of the building, but two separate parts. So this is the view uh, looking from the south side. And um, interior. This is also a very small project that about 400 square meters of interior design. It's a restaurant. A client was a Volkswagen, the German car company. And then they asked us to design a restaurant which, has, which, is, or which, which is with the theme of Tokyo. And as a Japanese for me, it was very difficult to actually implement the project when European clients ask something like that because I do understand, you know, from that European perception, you know, they have this very specific image of Tokyo and which I wasn't sure what to do. So what we actually designed is that they're using this acrylic panel um, of two centimeter thickness and uh, the Left side is the kitchen, and the right side is the open uh, restaurant, and then which is a terrace. And uh, we only designed the space-making elements with aluminum only. And then at the end, um, I invited nine different, most exciting Japanese uh, graphic designers from Tokyo, and then have them to install uh, their own um, art piece or installation. This looks like a model shot, but this is the actual uh, space that we built. So it's the restaurant. And then another project is, again, a different scale. Uh, this project is called uh, Van Backlick uh, Development, um, in, located in Bern in Switzerland. That site is actually located in an old waste recycling area. 80% of the total 40% of square meters will be housing. Uh, this is the master plan, and the price was given to uh, two categories, one for master plan and then one for the building prototype. We were second prize uh, for the master plan, and uh, we won the building uh, prototype proposal. So right now we are waiting for it to go into the next phase. And then we are also working on uh, 310,000 square meters of test planning project. Um, again, it's in Switzerland, uh, the area called Real West. Since the surrounding region is actually a suburban area and already has vacant commercial lots and the demand for land is not high enough, our master plan proposes to reposition the area with a temporary use first and only then develop it in steps to achieve the final function mix that is desired. Because you just uh, do the infrastructure first, then the land price is raised too quickly, then nobody would come into the site. So I think that's a bad idea, so we're trying to somehow reverse the thinking to it. So this is the vision of the um, Real West um, area. And like this, an um, urban farm, for example, this building, we call it urban farm, could serve such a transitional use. And this proposed project consists of greenhouses and the fish tanks and involves low investment costs and generates returns quickly. So, the, as I explained, the difference between these two conceptions of architectural professions, um, Japan versus, or versus, I'm not sure if that's a good word, but uh, you could call it uh, Switzerland, made me think a lot. And I had to actually reflect many times on Japanese urbanism. First, when we were thinking about density in the metropolitan region of Zurich, so this is the view, uh, metropolitan region of Zurich. 
and then secondary at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, where I taught for the last five years an architectural studio. I conducted a studio called, last one was called Learning from Tokyo Projects in Vienna. And we analyzed the city of Tokyo and Vienna in comparison, projecting Japanese project on the site in Vienna. And then, thirdly, this is Japan. Um, at Harvard University, um, I taught an architectural design studio uh, in 2011. I was initially asked by a Japanese private sector company to help rethink the redevelopment of the former Osaka Expo site project. So this is the 1970 former Osaka Expo site in Japan. And for the first time, I seriously started to consider an urbanism in Japan because, you know, before I thought about it, but there was no real project. And what I realized was that there actually is no real discourse no, um, on urban design in Japan. The discipline is invisible and the planning process is far too complicated. The site is actually right now is a park, but it has an urbanistic component to it. It is a project that deals with a very, very important historical site that was the birthplace of that metabolist project. I was shocked by the fact that on this, in this process, there was no architect was involved, not at all in the process. In the Japanese architectural discipline, there seemed to be no tool to deal with this kind of big scale project. And then a little bit more zoom in. I am actually not from Tokyo, from Osaka. And uh, I remember very much when I visited this expo. It was 1970, so I was five years old. I remember that um, everything was really shining in my eyes. And since then, I have visited many expos, but this was, for me, one of the most powerful, and uh, it had a symbolic nature that coincided with historic and national events at that time. So this project actually brought me back to my very first experience of architecture. Now, um, let me explain some project that he mentioned learning from Tokyo at the beginning in more detail. Um, last year, my office organized a symposium in Zurich called Learning from Tokyo. I'm showing this not as a good example, I'm showing this as a bad example. We wanted to actually investigate how this is situation now, how we might generate new housing typologies in Japan unlike this. We composed various housing um, typologies and methodologies. Um, we compare you know, these typologies and methodologies in both Tokyo and Zurich and discussing with Swiss and Japanese architects. So we have Riken Yamamoto, we have Diener, um, we have um, Akihisa Hirata, So Fujimoto, um, Ryuji Fujimura. Uh, the five architects came actually from Japan. And basically our hypothesis then was that in order to achieve a higher density and intensification of urban functions, new paths need to be taken. It was not just a discussion of density, density is discussed a lot, but we also wanted to talk about what it means to live in a city and the quality of living space in the city. I remember that the Swiss architect, Christian Kellitz, also he participated and he mentioned during the symposium that the Japanese project example showed how the context of the individual can be the context of the city. Then we concluded that Zurich actually has a unique chance to work with the potential created by a well-structured city and region. These are the region in Zurich. It is all characterized by economic stability and by population growth 
to become more metropolitan in its historically grown urban model. However, it also needs to rethink, because our thinking is quite conventional, some set assumptions, we have to rethink our set assumptions as its capacity is actually limited. Of course, during this discussion, we also realized and learned Japan has been facing a lot of problems. It's not only a good thing, but uh, we have a lot of problems. When it comes to city or town planning, these include the decreasing um, and aging population, shrinking towns in the countryside, and the fading government budget for pension funds and etc. So this map actually shows that in Japan, in the bottom 2035, more people will live in urban areas, but 33.7% 30, of the entire population will be older than 65 years old. Also, the population in general, this is the red thick um, line, um, in Japan will decrease from its current population of here 128 million to 95 million by 2050. So it's a dramatic um, decrease. Also, with my students in Vienna, we looked at the Tokyo more closely because we have to know the context. What is impressive in this photo, this photo is taken by the photographer Iwan Bon, um, is actually the juxtaposition between high-rise building and the small but numerous detached houses, um, which is somewhere here or somewhere here or somewhere there at the bottom. There are also small spaces such as gaps and streets like um, um, in between the buildings. Historically speaking, it was a type of new urban space, like a residence city. Each house was built independently with a gap between that had become urban due to the density. When you say Tokyo, Tokyo is a little bit abstract. So the definition must be clear. We, we <laughs> you know, if we are in Europe, they say, sometimes we think this is Tokyo, this is Tokyo, this is Tokyo, that is Tokyo. Right? So when we're comparing the area, for example, here, Vienna, it's easy to understand, the 23 uh, districts are similar to Tokyo's um, here, the same size, sorry, I can't see well, but the 23 words. The metropolitan area of Tokyo um, actually covers almost 13,000 square kilometers and refers to an economic region which is the strongest in Japan. Of course, it's one of the most densely populated areas in the world with a population of about 35 million people. So, Metropolitan Tokyo, which is this. If you remember that, then I would compare later with the different area in the west side of Japan. So this type of new urban space formed the largest area during the rapid urbanization of Tokyo in the 20th century. So when you see the timeline, and then if you see Vienna's um, population growth, actually it grew, but it shrinked a little bit. And uh, this is the scale of population. So in the 20th century, the rapid urbanization is obviously happened. And then it's a very different um, context between Tokyo and Vienna. However, um, in general, such areas did not receive enough attention in the past. So this was because the patterns of such urban space was considered to be a transient area that would be replaced with apartments or office buildings by further urbanization. However, this perception needed to be changed during the shrinking stage. Due to the high land prices in Japan, a large single family house was often demolished. After the owner's death in Japan, for example, in the West, 
when that kind of things happened, a large apartment complex would be constructed on a lot. It happens in Zurich like that. But in Tokyo, it is common that the land would be subdivided to the small lots uh, to build a row of affordable housing. And then each house will be less than 60 or 80 square meters. Then this is the large scale pro, uh, development. It's called Roppongi Hills so, or Tokyo Midtown in Tokyo. With the appearance of these kind of large scale urban redevelopment projects, the people started to pay more attention to the picture you saw before, that resident city as a contrast. So again, this picture, but currently, the average lifespan of Japanese houses around 30 years only. Therefore, what we see in this photo is already the last years of the second generation after 1945. Of course, renewals are made at different times and for different reasons. As a consequence, the Tokyo's residential area looks disordered. Also, urban regulation in Japan is very different. Um, urban regulation is not as strict as in Western countries. The Japanese building standard law has something called group rules, such as floor ratio area, floor area ratio, building coverage ratio, and setback regulation. But there is no single division or section integrating the construction of the city. So nobody is actually um, restricting, let's say, the totality of the city. That is why the city like Tokyo has no unified building aesthetic. Instead, there is a basic principle that the owner can build anything he or she wants within the site. If it's a private lot, then they can do anything actually they want. In European countries, the appearance of a house has a social role. The house belongs to the society and is not regarded as an expression of the owner's taste or style. This is the difference, in my opinion, in the representational system. Approximately um, 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 million houses are demolished each year in Japan right now. And while that's happening, 0 0.7 to 1 million new houses are built each year, every year. However, with the shortage of resources and a smaller budget, architecture needs to perform better so people can use the buildings longer than before. Of course, there are different types of building developments in the suburb in Japan, similar to you know, this high-rise city by Hilbert Simer. There is the modernist idea of collective housing, which puts habitable areas together while securing an open space. So modeled by that, these were mostly built in Japan in the 1960s and 70s. The problem is that the configuration of each apartment or configuration of living space or unit type, you can call it, has not changed since 60s and 70s. So the first introduction of, you know, we call the unit type 51C. Um, that after the World War II in 1951, it was designed and introduced, which is basically a two bedrooms and uh, they call it DK. DK is dining and kitchen. And they are now all facing problems because the problem of shrinking towns, you know, where this building is belong in the suburbs or in the countryside is very, very severe as are the problems of the fading government budget. Now, I just want to go back again. In 1960s, um, this is the cover of the book, the Japanese metabolist, seven of them, uh, not only all the architects included graphic designers, industrial designers, they were drafting their manifesto vision in which they discussed the city 
using the metaphor of a natural system. Here are some ideas and uh, built examples of metabolist projects. That metabolist is known basically the core or the structure of the building and infrastructure of the city is something stable. It doesn't move. And uh, everything else, living space or other spaces, should be replaceable or changed over time. And then 1970, the World Expo was held in Osaka, right? So this was the first World Fair held in Japan and the most numbers of visitors ever um, until Shanghai 2010 happened. And Kenzo Tange um, designed its master plan and 12 other Japanese architects built projects within the total site of altogether 330 hectare. As I mentioned before, it was the birthplace. It was the first time, actually, their idea got actualized. Um, it's a monorail and visitors, <clears throat> the most number of visitors ever until Shanghai, as I said. And mobility is an car parking of the time. And um, it's a symbol of the expo, it's called Sun Tower. The art of the artist called Taro Okamoto. And uh, this roof is done by Kenzo Tange. And then during the same time, uh, when expo happens, and then a new town was developed around the area and built, um, you know, these buildings or housings are all built around the expo park. Um, this is called Senri New Town. The area of development was more than 1,000 hectare and built by the Osaka Prefecture in 1962. I actually went to the school, high school here, and even though I lived two hours away um, by train, um, 150,000 people moved in when it was built, and 50 years has passed since then. This suburban area, like other suburban areas in Japan, is in a shrinking stage with an elderly population. So now I will be showing a little bit more in details one large scale project that I worked on together with students at the Harvard University. That project was to make an alternative proposal for the redevelopment of this site. Again, our client was a local special purpose company in Osaka. They had been working on the project in the past two years, but because they spent a lot of time, although they became skeptical, they started to question about their own proposal and concept, but because they worked so hard on it, nobody in the company had the guts to say no to their idea. So they decided to um, look for outside help. That was us. And so it's a former expo site. Basically, um, the right side, 264 hectare, became a park. They call it Expo Commemoration Park. Um, starting from 1972, so right after the expo finished. The site is divided into two areas, uh, north and south, by a national emergency highway. So national emergency hi highway means it's really heavy um, highway. So the site is actually disconnected. The preserved forest, which is this one, contains a nature park of 985,000 square meters and with 600,000 trees. The requested area of development, which was given to us, which is this side, which is in south, and then this is about 40 hectare. The parkland was owned by the nation and managed by their commemorative organization for the Japan Expo. So I don't know if you could see, but it's almost what you could see is empty. <laughs> so during the past 40 years, all of the Expo's pavilions, you know, built by known Japanese architect and historically important architectural monuments were all demolished 
except some memorial buildings and pieces. The park operation on its own was in the red, uh, so it didn't work well, and maintain maintenance was made possible only through the Japan World Exposition 1970 commemorative fund, which retained part of the revenue earned during the expo. So comprehensive planning to this area and the management of the park and the south sites provide an alternative funding method where revenue earned in new developments in the south, south is here, could be um, kept or put toward maintenance of the park itself in addition to coordinating events, exhibit, or new facilities between the north and the uh, south side. In the meantime, um, as I said, the surrounding areas, this is all highways and um, infrastructure, monorail, uh, severely disconnected from the surroundings, from the park grounds and then also, uh, by this kind of heavy infrastructure. This is the access map. So although bike and pedestrian paths exist, access from the neighborhoods to the park itself is indirect, hard to locate, and confusing to follow. So right now, the site looks like this. The nation, so the country, decided to abolish, abolish meaning abandon, the independent administrative organization and to shift the management of the, this park to the regional administration. The Osaka prefecture announced it was seeking public proposal to redevelop this area. And the aim or the proposal should increase, include an entertainment function and be able to turn the site into an internationally viable tourist attraction. And then they requested the site should have more than 5 million visitors per year. So our client proposal was to build an American theme park. Um, it was a Paramount Resort and an entertainment center on this site. While most of the amusement parks in Asia Pacific are in decline, we analyzed and researched, in terms of numbers of visitors per year. Um, when the proposal was to build American theme park, then we really had to ask real questions, like this diagram shows, how can we use this redevelopment project really for the benefit of the city? Osaka is basically located here. You know Japan, you know Tokyo. They are well-known nation and the city, but I'm not sure if you know Osaka and the Kansai region are not as well-known, um, though the region contains about 20% of the whole Japanese population. As you can see, Osaka is very dense after Tokyo and Kanagawa. This is the economy map of Japan. Osaka is very productive. Um, it's the third largest in GDP in Japan. And this is the global flight connection. So Osaka is, in fact, globally connected. Osaka in the global financial context, which is here. That's Tokyo. What does that mean? Osaka in a global financial context, GDP actually in billion US dollars. As we can see, their economy is fairly large. Um, it is big enough to compare with that of Seoul in Korea or like Moscow or Sydney in, in Australia, right? But while Moscow and Seoul each attract 20 million and 8 million foreign visitors per year, Osaka only attracts about 1.5 million. So 
although the economy structure reaches an international level, we can tell, we can clearly tell that the culture and the image of the city remain at the very domestic level. So again, Osaka is located in a region called Kansai, where the blue area is, which has an area of almost 30,000 square meters. That Ratovia is about 65,000, so it's less than half. That population is about 20 million. Latvia is about 2 million, so 10 times more. The population of Kanto is 35.2 million. So this is the Kansai area within Osaka, or as others call it, the Keihanshin metropolitan area. It's the same area, and it also includes um, Kyoto, if you know, the top, and the Kobe. Uh, Kobe is the sister city of Riga, which is that there, the left. And Osaka itself includes 33 cities, nine towns, and seven villages. And when you see here, Osaka itself, so it's Osaka city, right? Osaka prefecture, and that this is the region we're talking about. The dots are new projects that's going on. But when you see colors, it is actually overlapping so they initiated several urban renewal projects in the region. And um, one project is currently in preparation is the project that I worked on. But the current urban development project map of this region shows like this, that multiple projects with the same or similar contents. Location of the project site. Um, students did the research on three different topics and categories. Uh, theme is one, the engine is the second, and the context as the third. That's the former expo area. The city itself is actually called Suita City. And from the center of Osaka, it is about 17 kilometers uh, to the north. It takes about 35 minutes by train. And then aerial photo of the former expo site. And the red area is the location of the project site. And as I explained, the student did the research on theme, engine, and context. And this map actually shows a historical and geographical documentation of the most successful and unsuccessful theme parks in the last uh, 100 years. Uh, when you see this is a timeline, the above is survived theme park, the bottom is dead uh, theme park. And uh, in the last 100 years, almost 90 theme parks were opened. 47% of the parks are still operating. Successful parks have more than 100 million visitors per year. So those are, you know, which is theme parks is above receiving more visitors per year. So they are called it successful. And uh, as the park developed globally, the map, or this map, distinguishes four typologies of networking by region. Theme parks are ranked according to their access and number of visitors per year. Back to Japan, the theme parks and an urban synergies, as this diagram shows, one in Osaka and then one in Tokyo, um, in case of Tokyo, uh, they have two theme parks, and this is airport, that's the city center. The same, same things can be analyzed in Osaka. We concluded that 
In the case of Osaka, which is there, building another theme park on this particular location doesn't make sense. So what do we do? We looked at the case study project and proposed contextualized design strategies. We attempted to define a series of very basic frameworks or for discussion based on the scale, concept, necessity, business model, benefit, synergy, and coordination of project. For example, like this, what if we proposed Osaka Central Park using the basic frameworks of Central Park in New York? Also, what if we proposed Osaka Metropolitan using the basic frameworks of the Bilbao project? Again, what if we proposed Kansai Village using the basic frameworks of the Mastal City in Abu Dhabi project? What if we proposed Osaka Suita Walk using the basic frameworks of city work done by John Jardy in Hollywood in USA? And then lastly, uh, what if we proposed Kansai Park using the basic frameworks of the Emscher Park rural area in Germany project? Again, the important question to the students and also to us was, what could we project onto this empty area or we could call it void? What could we apply? What tools would work? And what tools would not work? Then, students' proposal to revitalize the existing Expo Park. This is a comparison of the size of the park. So Expo Park itself has actually quite big in comparison to other urban public parks in the world. So this park has the potential to become the largest public park in Japan. The project was phased, so the park first benefit local users, and then it would gradually form a synergy with other recreational programs to attract global visitors, maybe. Managing a large-scale urban public park is not common practice in Japan. Therefore, the business model was learned from the park management of New York Central Park. This is um, using Kansai's intellectual infrastructure. The another student's group proposed an international research and housing campus on the site. They proposed a master plan concept for both the public and the private sector. For the public sector, a special purpose company funded by universities, private investors, and the local governments would be responsible for project delivery operation, and also management. For the private sector, they proposed to properly restructure the green area. So students actually went a lot further than what it was given. And according to the current Japanese zoning code, they found out that urban parks with underground facilities or athletic fields with synthetic turfs, or some parking lots, and even golf course are defined as green in Japan. It's kind of ridiculous. Then although they observed 
that the districts are facing an aging problem, as you saw the photo before, this resource can be a great re um, development theme for regional urban regeneration. This student's group proposed to transform the Osaka Expo Park into the largest trade fair, convention, and event center in the Kansai region. It's a master plan, and the project should be seen as part of the broader strategy of regional identity promotion and enhancement. Their business plan is drawn on the basis of the Bilbao case. Um, this is the Bilbao between 2006 and 2010 um, in a larger scale. And the most successful trade fair models analyzed around the world. The very last students group analyzed European model of Emscher Park in rural Germany. When they looked at the site on a regional scale, they said that, they clearly said that the story of Osaka's success is still a work in progress. So they questioned about the content, they questioned about the proposal. After understanding the project of the rural valley, the students group actually did not propose the project, and they did not think that the alternative proposal of a large-scale project on our site in Osaka would stimulate growth at all. Instead, they proposed that the region should focus on the creative cultures and industries that they already have. They asked how we could take advantage of this condition to strengthen collaborative networks at the regional level and to pursue global recognition. So this was the business model. So in conclusion, from the 1970s um, until recently, architects did not deal with urbanism in Japan. Instead, urbanism was some, something to be dealt with by bureaucrats, officials, and by large corporate companies and general contractors. But we now see an interesting new development, at least I do see, because in the meantime, many big questions, for example, demographic change, shrinking cities, ecology, and sustainability issue arise that are in discussion right now. That role of the architect is in question. The interesting is that, that out of this void, during the project that I worked on with Harvard students, all of these difficult but important questions were, came up. There is the real opportunity right now especially in Japan after the March 11, the disaster in Tohoku, to rethink certain aspects of the profession that for the last 30 or 40 years have been kept completely fixed. There is real pressure and a real need. And what is important is that the Expo Park site became a projection surface where all of these problems became visible. Japan lacks resources and money. In the age of expansion, one could create new areas or new development projects by erasing whole existing site, for example. But there is not enough money to do so. We need to respect the existing area. This means that you cannot come up with some large development project hoping that the future will be very different. We don't need dogmatic approach either. Instead, 
we must carefully work with the existing context, the new intervention should gradually influence the surrounding areas to change the present situation. We need to preserve continuity from the present to future. So in many ways, I personally think that the Japan has put the era of modernization and establishment of consumer culture behind it. It has reached an era of incremental. Incremental means step by step. Urbanism, like we know it here in Europe. In order to preserve this continuity, we should have a toolbox that we can work with in a context-specific manner. The problem then is how to communicate such a diverse and subtle problem or subtle approach. The media and the market force us and the architect to create one-liners, big gestures, but reality, I believe, demands complexity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosaya. Questions, please. Out of this very comprehensive coverage, uh, let me then, uh, you said about this learning from Tokyo. Yes. Somehow, somewhere I read that this was about small scale developments. Yes and impacts to urban patterns from the small scale viewpoint? Uh, no, the learning from Tokyo is basically a name of symposium and it was organized by Swiss architect and then our office in Zurich. And it started the question because um, in Switzerland, um, you know, in future we know that there will be a lot of population moving in, but the green field or brown field is limited so the policy wants to make the city center, let's say, dense. But dense means that uh, we, as uh, people who live, have to somehow accept the fact that the smaller square meter is okay, right? But the tendency right now in Zurich is that uh, we usually have 80 square meters. We want 100 square meters. Now we want 120 square meters. So it's just basically growing. So there's a discrepancy between the policy and the people's needs. So architects somehow gather while we're talking about density, but it is not about the discussion of density because when you look at Tokyo, I do know that Zurich and Tokyo is not comparable. It's a big difference. But you know why in Tokyo there are such a um, openness and the issue of typology of creativity is possible, and the smallness they feel rather comfortable. <laughs> they accept such a. Um, certain restrictions to live in a city because you know there is a context to live in, you know, which right now Zurich doesn't have. So we were trying to somehow discuss and then compare the differences, but at the time, same time, to come up with you know why we don't talk about space typology. Then you mentioned that there is quite a movement, which you call small scale protagonists or something like that. Is it really a moment somehow to secure these small scale individualities? Uh, is it a moment or uh, is I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say it's a movement, <laughs> but uh, if there is a need and the area is limited, right? But if you want to have a quality in life and a quality of living space, then just reducing square meters is not enough. You have to give something additional. What is it? <laughs> is it the palace, is it the balcony, or is it the city as a context? So I think that was a part of the discussion. And uh, this Edo question about the constructing of previous rivers, uh, some, somewhere again I read Edo was uh, once as rich with waters as uh, so Tokyo. Yeah, Tokyo, Edo was as rich with waters with Venice. So, Venice? Yeah. That's, I wasn't talking about that at all. And we were not dealing with it. I was just looking at historic patterns of the yeah. city mm -hmm. as an argument about future yeah. development. That, that was the very background of the question. Um, more questions, please. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry. So, we have taught uh, architecture in several schools in different countries. And I wanted to ask your opinion about. Uh, architecture 
education and maybe on what are based uh, uh, your work with students in such schools? Sorry, one more time question. Uh, uh, how do you, on what do you base your work with students in studios? What do I base? I'm trying to understand. What are your uh, like, uh, main principles? Main principles? Yeah. Um, when I, okay, I started to teach in 2005, and then first I taught in the USA, it's called Common University, and then it was a um, bunch of um, students, but what was interesting is that they called it interdisciplinary studio. Interdisciplinary meaning that uh, I believe, uh, or I enjoy to collaborate with the expert, you know, who's a structural engineer or mechanical engineer or sustainability designer from the concept, not only to deal with them, What's interesting is that um, um, I worked for Toyota. 
um, it becomes that energy. <laughs> you're creating something interesting you know, to the context. So at this moment, um, I am actually in Zurich, but I have family. So therefore, that somehow local context become for me, it's a fighting <laughs> platform because it's physically, you know, I want to do something different and so on. So in this sense, I'm not sure how to say, it. Am, I, am I working from Japanese perception or Swiss? But I try, always try to somehow find local situation which somehow to give the, try to solve, you know, what I see that the problem.